Hi, my name is Kerry Clark, and I'm a member of the Skia team. Skia provides the graphics for Android, the Android framework, and for Chrome. Skia draws the rectangles, the bitmaps, the text, and paths. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, are paths and paths ops. I started working at Apple uh, a long time ago, and at that time, the Apple II really uh, started my love of graphics. The Apple II had a high resolution bitmap with a 280 by 192 screen. It had a pair of them actually. And with that, uh, the world was my oyster. I could draw anything I wanted. And it was just amazing. Unfortunately, the Apple II didn't really have any uh, built-in graphics routines at that time. Sometime later, when I was introduced to the Lisa and the Quick Draw, uh, Macintosh computers, I learned about QuickDraw. And QuickDraw is the software on a Macintosh, uh, on the original Macintosh, that drew to the screen. QuickDraw had arcs. And that was my first introduction into a computer that had a curved primitive, a circular arc. A little while later, the Macintosh had the laser writer, which was a PostScript printer. PostScript had a whole new class of curves called cubic beziers, which were pretty exotic but they looked great, especially when they were scaled up. And it was pretty mind-blowing how well PostScript could take a document and rotate it or skew it or scale it. In 1988, TrueType and a little before that, QuickDraw GX came out. I was fortunate enough to work on QuickDraw GX. And at that time, I decided to add quadratics to quick draw instead of cubics or arcs. The quadratic is a little bit simpler than a cube. It has one less control point, but it had a, has a lot of the same properties. And I was happy that TrueType also so, uh, chose quadratics and allowed me to have some validation that my choice was a good one. Skia has all of these types. It has arcs, it has cubics, quadratics, and now it has conics, which are sections of a cone which include quadratics. And a path op is a way to take all of these curves and operate on them with set operations. When QuickDraw was introduced back in the 80s, it had a way of describing an area of the screen that was called a region. And it was just a collection of rectangles. But it was the basis for the Macintosh windows and the windowing system. A little while later, with PostScript and uh, QuickDraw, GX, and so forth, uh, paths were introduced. And paths, like regions, describe an area of the screen. But that area can include circles and triangles. And it's a control point-based area. So instead of a set of rectangles, it's something that can have arbitrary curves and arbitrary lines. QuickDraw used its rectangle-based path, its region, to build a windowing system. And the windowing system allowed QuickDraw to draw to just the part of the window that was visible. The way it did this is it had operations called region ops that could do things like intersect a pair of regions or take the difference of one from the other. This was a very powerful concept that Bill Atkinson, the author of QuickDraw, invented. I liked it so much that I wanted to do the same thing for QuickDraw GX. But instead of just making it work for rectangles, I wanted it to work for any arbitrary geometry and be able to rotate or skew a path and operate on it. With ordinary paths, say a pair of ovals, it's very difficult to translate those ovals from one graphic system to another. For instance, Skia can describe a path with a pair of ovals but to do a hardware acceleration and translate those ovals to something like OpenGL, it's difficult because OpenGL doesn't have a primitive that will describe those curves. Worse, if each oval individually is sent to, to uh, OpenGL, the pair of curves may not blend together well. If each, either one has transparency, then you'll see the transparent addition of the two rather than just the area that the two describe. That's why uh, OpenGL systems often 
create stencil buffers that have the bitmap that describes, in this case, a pair of ovals, and uploads that rather than uploading the geometry of those pair of ovals. The blank portion of Chrome that reads in the HTML web page can create some very complicated geometries. CSS allows defining uh, different gradients for different parts of a rounded rectangle, for instance. So the clip might look something like this illustration. That clip is only the, the portion of the gray is the only portion that's actually drawn. But the uh, clip contains all the other shapes as well. And it's, it's difficult to do an acceleration of just the portion that's being drawn when all the other geometries are present in the clip stack. Blink also allows drawing the difference of, of, of a shape. So when doing graphics, so when going from SCIA to PDF, for instance, uh, we have to draw the PDF data into an off-screen bitmap and render that instead of being able to calculate the geometry that would be result from subtracting a rectangle from another rectangle. ShapeOps tries to address this need. Here, this simplify operation takes a pair of blue rectangles and will compute the area that would result from drawing both of them. This is the simplest path op. Path ops also have binary operations that take a pair of paths. So in this case, we're computing the intersection of a pair of rectangles from two separate rectangles. The union operator looks a lot like the simplify operator. It uses two paths, each with a single contour, instead of one path with two contours. A contour is a closed portion of a path. So it's a continuous closed loop. There's a pair of difference operators. This difference operator subtracts the dark green rectangle from the blue one. There's a reverse difference that would subtract the blue rectangle from the dark green one. For completeness, there's also exclusive OR, although this one isn't used very much. And finally, there's complement, which describes all of the area that's outside of a path. As it turns out, there's no special function for complement because SCIA's paths have a way of describing whether it's the fill or the inverse fill. So the complement is just toggling those two attributes. There's no reason to implement all of these path ops as separate functions, since they're really all the same thing. In this illustration, we have the uh, paths A and B and their complements running down the column on the left, and different uh, path operations running in the row across the top. So you can see that the intersection of A and B is the same as the difference of A complement B or the, exclusion, the exclusive OR of A and B is the same as the union of A minus B and B minus A. It's also the difference between the intersection and the union. So what's all this good for? Back when fonts were originally ported to computers, a lot of times the complex characters were created by drawing individual characters on top of each other, like a slash on top of the letter O. If you drew the outline of those characters, you'd get an undesirable result as shown here because you would see both outlines at the same time, where you'd really like to see only the portion described by the area of the two characters. So the question is, how do we get from there to here? When I first wrote this in the 80s, my approach was very similar to the way I drew these characters. I would start by finding the maxima and minima of the curves. Once they were split, I would then find all the vertical occurrences where either a new curve started, a new curve stopped, or a pair of intersections occurred. Given all those vertical events, I would sort them and then walk across them horizontally and find every place where one of the curves 
intersected that horizontal line. Then I would have to sort those as well. Finally, if a pair of curves or a line in a curve had the same uh, y value for some given x value, I had to sort those to know which one would contribute to the final path first. All of the sorting is required because of something called the winding number rule. And the winding number rule says that the direction of the path describes whether it contributes uh, or subtracts from the output. So in this case, the down arrows contribute a plus one to the answer, and the up arrows contribute a minus one to the answer. If I sum those numbers as I move across from left to right, every time that a zero changes to a one or a one changes to a zero, that's a line that I keep. If it changes from one positive number to another, those are lines I discard. That will give me the desired output that I want. This time around, it occurred to me that all that sorting was a lot of work and took a lot of time, and there was probably a simpler approach. In fact, there are really only eight intersection points between these pairs of curves and lines that I actually care about. All the other sorting information is, is superfluous to the real answer. If I look at any one of those intersections, instead of thinking about how the winding number is affected as I traverse across the entire shape from left to right, I, I can think about what the winding number contribution is at that intersection point as I move around in a circle. If I know what the intersection is for each, uh, as each curve con contributes to the answer, once again, when zero moves to one or one moves to zero, those are lines I keep. But when it goes from one positive number to the next, those are lines I discard. The great benefit of this is, once I have one answer, that answer propagates around the rest of the curve. So I don't need to keep computing the uh, inside or outness, outsideness of the shape. And I can keep all of the information all the way around to the point that I run into another intersection. But before I can get there, I have to be able to find the intersections. So let's take a look at one of the curve types. This is a quadratic Bezier. It's defined by a couple of control points on the ends and one control point in the middle. The quadratic Bezier is parallel to the endpoints, the, the tangents of the quadratic Bezier from the first to the second point define how the curve moves. A pair of quadratic Beziers are portions of a pair of parabolas. So they can intersect in as many as four points. So that's a clue as to what the answer is going to be to find the intersection of a pair of quadratics. I'll need to be able to find at least four solutions. So if there is a solution, it's going to have to be able to find four roots. Back in the original illustration, I mentioned that I have to divide the curves into a pair. Uh, I have to divide the curves at the maxima and the minima before I could proceed. This was because everything was sorted in Y. The first time I did this, I thought that also meant that it simplified the solution for the intersection of a pair of curves. I thought if there are four intersections for a pair of parabolas, surely there are only two intersections if they're subdivided, so they only increase in Y. I was wrong. There are three intersections for monotonically increasing curves. And this was quite embarrassing when I figured it out for the first time back in the 80s. So this time around, I decided to be much more careful about the mathematics and the geometry so I wouldn't fall into the same sort of mistake again. So let's take a look at intersecting, pair, uh, intersecting a pair of curves. For these curves, I want to find the intersection, and I want to do so by creating the mathematics that will solve the answer directly. Another approach would be to subdivide the curves, but we'll talk about that in just a moment. If I look at what the solution is without looking at how I'm going to get there, I can imagine that there is a value called t, which varies from 0 to 1 <laughs> as I traverse across the curve. The, uh, it, when, when 
t is equal to zero, it's going to be at the c0 and c0 prime. And when t is at one, it's going to be at c2. And anywhere in between, it's going to describe a point along the curve. So for these sample pieces of data, the t is a 1.25 for one curve and 0.63 for the other. And when I plug the t into some equation, I'll get the same intersection point for both curves. In Skia, by the way, the y points down instead of up. So things may look a little upside down from the math you're used to. So let's get back to solving curves by subdividing. This solution is the one that I used originally in the 80s, and it's very popular today as well. And there's been a lot of work to optimize this, such as the work by T.W. Cedarberg at BYU using convex hulls to optimize subdivision. I found this solution ultimately unworkable because it falls down when two curves are very close to the same. In this case, every time the curves are subdivided, the pair of curves are still very close to the same. And even though they don't touch each other, it's impossible to tell without further subdivision. So I found in this case that there was a very long tail before I would know whether or not the solution was found. So this is a solution I tried and abandoned. So going back to the math approach, this is the Bernstein equation for a quadratic Bezier. And it simply describes the x and y values for some value of t from 0 to 1. As I said before, if t is 0, the answer is c0. If t is 1, the answer is c2. And if the t is any other value, it's somewhere along the curve. The simplified form of the equation collects the values together. So that now I have a simple quadratic, which is very easy to solve. The implicit form of the equation is a little more complicated, but it describes an entire parabola instead of the quadratic section, which is a piece of that parabola. Even though the math looks daunting, it turns out there's enough common terms that it only takes about 28 multiplies and 11 adds to get from the simple form to the implicit form. Once I have both the implicit and parametric forms of the equation, I can plug one into the other. So I can take the second equation, which describes how x and y are in terms of t, and I can plug that answer into the third equation to get rid of the t altogether and have something I can solve for t. Once I have the quartic equation, now I can find the solution that will give me the intersection of one curve with the other. But this just gives me the t values for the first curve. I have to do the reverse and plug the second equation into the first in order to get the complement, in order to get the t values for the prime equation. Once I have the t values for both equations, I can plug them in and ensure that they return the same x and y values for each of the quadratics. Since I have a quadratic solution that's robust and works well, you might think I would also be able to use that same solution for cubics. After all, cubics are just quadratics with one more control point, so they can't be that much more complicated. Here's the Bernstein polynomial for a cubic equation, which looks a lot like the quadratic one. It just has one more term, and it has cubes instead of squares. If I overlay a pair of, of cubics on top of each other, I'll find that they can have as many as nine intersections. And this ought to set off alarm bells because it's going to be very hard to find nine roots for an equation. If I plug the equation into Mathematica, I get a rather daunting looking result. And notice that this still has everything in terms of x and y. So this is not the complete solution. This is half of it. I still have to plug all of the x and y values from the alternate equation into this equation. So things are looking sad for solving cubics with mathematics. Sure enough, if I work all the way through, I'll end up with a ninth ordered equation for which there is no general solution. And even though there's a lot of advancements in root finding, 
and computers are much faster than they were 25 years ago, people haven't gotten a whole lot smarter. So this sort of equation is impossible to solve directly in a robust manner. So let's take a look at the cubic again. This cubic intersects itself. So not only do I need to find how the cubic intersects another cubic, but I need to know its own intersection. This gives me a clue as to how I might solve the intersection. Rather than try to solve the cubic directly, I can approximate it with a series of quadratics and then use my quadratic intersection to find the actual solution. Once I get the intersection values in T with quadratics, I can take those same T values and apply them back to the cubic and then check to see if they return the same X and Y value. This turns out to be a pretty robust solution that works very well. So here's a pair of cubics that intersect each other connected to a line. For lines and cubics and lines and lines and lines and quadratics, I can solve those directly. I don't have to do any special math. So this line does not intersect cubic one. It just misses touching it. But the pair of cubics intersect each other. When I approximate one cubic with a quadratic, the quadratic approximation is very close which is fine. It's just exactly what I want it to be. The cubic continues off to the right, and as the cubic continues, the quadratic approximation drifts a little bit further away, but not too far. But for the first cubic, its endpoints are far off the screen. So the quadratic approximation at this point is the furthest it ever gets from the cubic. So even though the line does not intersect the cubic, it's also the case that the pair of quadratics do not intersect each other. So using a straightforward solution, I missed this intersection altogether, and my path ops produced the wrong result. To find the intersection of the cubics, I have to rely on the convex hull. The convex hull is what happens when you connect all the control points of the cubic together. It describes a polygon around which the cubic is guaranteed to be contained by. If I look at the very end of the convex hull, these tiny little line segments, then I can find the intersections of those lines with the opposing cubic and use that to find the intersections of the pair of cubics. Since I only have to do this at the very ends of the cubics, it's a trivial computation and it allows the entire calculation to be robust. Now that I have the intersections of cubics, quadratics, and lines, that I can get back to performing my path operations. As before, I'd like to find all of the places where an intersection travels, and I would like to compute all the crossings in a circle. And as I move counterclockwise around all of those crossings, I'd like to uh, accumulate the winding number to know which edges to keep and which line edges to discard. In this example, a triangle and a pair of circles touch at the same point, and there are two lines and two quadratics that all descend from that point. And I need to sort them uh, as I move around counterclockwise. When I sort the pair of lines, the answer is straightforward. The direction of the line allows me to know which line is to the left of the other using a simple cross, cross product. For the line in the quadratic, I, can, I, can, I can't use that trick because the initial tangent of the quadratic is the same as the line but I can use the fact that the quadratic curls away from the line to know whether it curls to the right or the left of the line. For a pair of quadratics, the answer is not so simple. This particular pair of quadratics have exactly the same implicit equation. That is, they're part of the same parabola. And for that matter, they're the exact same part of that same parabola. So they have the same uh, curve shape. And if I take the derivative of each curve, I won't get any more information because the derivative will be identical for these two. So even though it's clear by looking at them that Q2 is to the left of Q1, it's hard to fi figure that out mathematically. My solution for now is to take the shorter of the two tangents and bisect that with the shorter of the start and end points and sort those intersections. Empirically, this 
produces the right result, uh, although there may be a better one. All of this sorting falls apart when the numerics become small. So here I have a line that travels between two points off the screen. And here are the approximations of that line as represented by little circles. This grid represents the floating point resolution that's available to me. So if my numbers are in doubles, then each grid line represents the smallest possible value that that double can represent. In other words, there's no, no way, way to, to represent, represent any value smaller than the grid lines. When I intersect a pair of lines, I'm going to find, at best, the number that is the truncation of the actual intersection. In other words, because double precision is finite, everything is going to round down. Here's the second line that intersects the original line. And once again, the intersection, as the best possible approximation, rounds down and is represented by the red circle. When I consider which of these lines I would encounter first when traveling from left to right, I see visually that the blue line is to the left of the red line. But when I walk across and look at the answers that I received from the intersection, I hit the red dot before I hit the blue dot. So basically, the math lied to me. It gave me the wrong intersection. As it turns out, this would not be important because this little triangular sliver, even though it would be incorrectly computed, is so small, it wouldn't draw. It would simply disappear. But if I'm doing the same work with a curve instead of a pair of lines, then all of a sudden, the area described between the blue line and the red curve can become very large. And my error, likewise, becomes very large. And now my answer is wrong for a large portion of the path out. This means that for a lot of computation, I need just to decide that the answer is just unknowable. It may be unsortable, it may be tiny, or it may be unorderable. But I can't necessarily compute what the answer is for an intersection. To solve this in the general case, I simply find another intersection that I do know and propagate that answer back to the intersection that I don't know. If a pair of shapes exactly overlap each other, as is in the case of this pair of rectangles, the path up is pretty straightforward to compute. In this case, the dark green rectangle is below the blue one, and so I just want to return the top of the blue one as the answer. A lot of the online references that I researched suggest that when points are difficult to compute, that you could jiggle the points in order to compute the actual answer. But this is a case where jiggling is destructive. If I move the lower rectangle's shapes around a little bit to avoid having coincident points, then my answer will have extra little spikes on them. While these spikes are so small they may not draw, they prevent me from having a convex result, which might be a special operation or a special optimization when the shape is accelerated. Also, it prevents me from knowing the actual bounds of the, of the resulting shape. And it makes hit testing hard, because I can't guarantee that a tap on the shape won't accidentally be inside one of those little triangles. So this is one reason why jiggling, I think, is not a robust solution to path ops. While I can't do jiggling, I also can't do precise math, because there's enough error term in all these calculations that I always have to worry about what the error is. So I spend a lot of time thinking about the unit of least precision, which is the error term. When I compare numbers between 0 and 1, I can describe exactly what that error is. And the error I chose is the smallest amount that a floating point value can represent, a 32-bit float can represent. This Computation can be done all in float space or in the SIMD registers or the neon registers on an ARM chip. And it's a fairly fast computation to make. 
When the values are arbitrary, as in an ordinary x and y point part of the Cartesian coordinate, then the only reasonable way to determine the, the equality is to look at the integer bit representation of the floating point numbers. This is expensive because it requires taking the original float values and moving them out of the float registers and into the integer ALU before the comparison can be done. And that will always stall the float pipeline. So whenever possible, I work in t-space between 0 and 1 and avoid comparing x's and y's as much as I possibly can. I have a whole lot of epsilon values that I currently use, depending on the complexity of the math. I hope over time to simplify and reduce the number of epsilons required to perform this calculation. And a lot of these are seat of the pants numbers, but they're the best I know how to do. There's a lot of unanswered questions in PathOps. For instance, here's a shape that has more than one possible solution. When I simplify it, I might end up with an L-shaped corner, or I might end up with a small rectangle in the middle. Both of these are equally valid answers, and there's no reason to prefer one over the other. But one might be more desirable for graphic acceleration, for instance. And currently, I don't have a way for the algorithm or the user to choose one over the other. Similarly, I don't have a way of choosing winding direction. So here are two shapes with different winding. The top one winds to the right on the outer contour, and the bottom one winds to the left. While these draw equivalently and are otherwise identical, they might have different results, for instance, if you dash the shapes, because the dashing is going to start at a different point, and it's going to travel in a different direction. This is another area where I don't have a way to choose one over the other, nor know what the user's real intent was. Finally, right now I only compute areas. So for instance, given this rotated rectangle and a rectangular clip, I return a, a parallelogram, which is the area of the intersection. But there may be some reason to return a pair of lines instead, because those lines would be the part of the frame that's visible inside the clip. This is another case where I don't know what the user's intent was, and I also don't know if the lower answer is some, an answer that's valuable. To this point, I'm only coding the answers that actually have a practical use. Once there's a need for this sort of computation, it's an easy thing to add, but I'll wait until it shows up as an optimization for Skia before I add it. Here's the current source code. Everything is public, open source, and checked in. And you can go get any of the PathOps code, the interfaces or the sources here. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about how I debugged and wrote PathOps and show you a small demo. And I'm going to do my updates later. When I generate PathOps, I do a lot of printfs, and the printfs look a lot like this. And while these numbers are helpful, sometimes they're very hard to visualize. So I wrote a way to visualize them. Oops, how do I get there from here? There we go. The, this is a web page that contains a canvas, and the canvas contains the printf output that I showed earlier, which is at the bottom of the screen. The top part of the screen shows visualizing that output and visualizing pieces of that output. So for instance, all of these little circles show the winding values that are computed for this shape. And if I look at a pair of these shapes, a pair of these tests, I can see at least one place where I computed a different answer on the two different shapes. That's where the bug was that I had to trace down here. This particular canvas allows me to see a lot of information about the path ops that I compute. For instance, I can see all of the edges as they're first computed, and then I can step through each set of edges and watch how they're processed. Or I can see 
the edges as their output so that I know at what point in the code each edge is generated. So here's the output that this particular test generated. And here's the output that the test that failed generated. So I can compare the two and have a pretty good idea where things went wrong. Here's another example that shows a, a cubic, a pair of cubics, and it also shows the quadratics that were generated to approximate those cubics. So this is actually showing both the cubics and the quadratics at the same time. But I can look at just the quadratics, or I can look at just the cubics, and make sure that my answers are accurate. And as you can see here, there's very little visible difference between the quadratic approximation and the actual cubic curve. This one is going to show the actual data that a web page passes me. So this comes off of eldorado.com, and it contains a parallelogram containing a rounded rect that is also a parallelogram. And this is actual CSS data that describes a clip. This particular data is deceptive because even though those lines look like they touch each other, they don't. They're actually very close, but not the same, and makes the math hard to figure out. And here are some other examples of actual web pages and the clips that they produce that drive me crazy. For any of these, I can show the data that's generated, and then I can also show the printfs that generated that data. And by advancing through the data visually and advancing through the text, I can then go back to my C code and set breakpoints and figure out where things went wrong. This has been a very helpful tool for me. So now I'd like to show you a quick demo of PathOps in action. So here we are running some of the unit tests that I've written for PathOps. At this point, I have around 73 million tests, and we're seeing a few of them here. Each of these tests is drawing the path ops and computing the result. It's also using Skia to create a region with the original shapes and the result. Then I compare the bits drawn by my path ops and the bits drawn by the region and make sure there's not any amount, any considerable amount of error between the two. This is part of the Skia unit test suite, and this is run every time Skia is built on all platforms, including Android, Chrome OS, Mac, Windows, and Linux in 32-bit and 64-bit. So I've made sure that this code is robust and works across a lot of different platforms. So that's it for the, for the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Please write me if you have any questions. Thank you.